Hello? There it is. Good morning. Let me welcome you this morning uh, to our large gathering call to worship on this first day of May. It comes from the final verses of Psalm 68. To him who rides on the heavens, the ancient heavens, behold, he sends out his voice, his mighty voice, ascribe power to God, whose majesty is over Israel and whose power is in the skies. Awesome is God from his sanctuary, the God of Israel. He is the one who gives power and strength to his people. Blessed be God. Let's pray together this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you uh, for this time and this place to gather together as your, as your bride, as your church, our church family in uh, worship to you. Lord, we come in from various places with our thoughts coming from different distracted areas, Lord, but we, we pause and we focus, we uh, reject the message that is pounded into us throughout the week from our culture around us that wants to force us to be the center uh, of our lives, that says we ought to be um, ruler and we recognize you as almighty, you as everlasting. God, you, are, you truly are awesome in your sanctuary. You are God. It is you who are the one who gives power and strength to your people. Blessed be your name this morning. Amen. Amen. Why don't you stand as we start our worship this morning? Singing how marvelous, how wonderful in my song shall it Let's give him praise this morning, church.
below. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in that desert place. Though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Sing every blessing. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name. going to read uh, Isaiah 26, verse 3. You keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you, because he trusts in you. Let's all pray together. Father, as we look out over the current events of our world today, it's a challenge for us to trust you. From our perspective, it sometimes appears that our enemy is in, is in control. May we be reminded that you are ultimately in control, that you love us beyond all measure, and that you are a good, good father. We bring our petitions before you this morning. We lift up the people of Ukraine have mercy on them. We pray for their lives, both spiritual and physical. Through this evil, may the nation of Ukraine be drawn closer to you. 
We pray for the authentic Christians in Russia. God, give them courage to speak out against this war. Father, we ask for peace. God, we lift up the families in Andover who were affected by the, the tornadoes this weekend. We are thankful that no lives were lost. Father, be close to those who have lost their homes and all of their, all of their possessions. Surround them with brothers and sisters who will help them rebuild. Some of these families we know personally. God, make us aware. Make this faith family aware of the needs so that we can be your hands and feet. Father, we pray for our city government. We pray for our mayor, <clears throat> our city council, many of whom profess to be followers of you. We pray that you would give them wisdom to lead us and to govern us. May they lead us in a way that draws this city closer to you. God, we lift up our families who are in other countries serving you. We lift up Kyle and Kathy Ferguson. We pray that the people that they are reaching will become Bible-believing disciples. Give Kyle and Kathy both physical and spiritual strength for their task. May they be great examples to their children of how to love you and love each other. And God, we lift up uh, First Baptist Church in Mays. We pray for their pastor, Colin Smothers. May, be he, may he be a pastor who loves the people you have put under his care. We pray that his preaching would be centered on your word and that he would boldly proclaim the truth. Father, we pray that First Baptist Mays would be a, a light for you in that community. God, you keep us in perfect peace when our minds are fixed on you because we trust in you. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Why don't you stand with me? I'm going to read from Matthew chapter 6, verses 7 through 13. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also forgive in our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. See you. 
I invite you to take your Bible and open with me to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13, as we continue our 
who knows how long we've been in the Gospel of Matthew. We're almost getting to the halfway point. I kind of wondered what it would be like. You know, I've, I've um, pastors and preachers who've gone before me, who've been in the ministry a long time, who, who set out philosophically like I do, just to preach through books of the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, Old Testament, New Testament, this genre, that genre, I'm trying to give you, as you've heard me say before, like a, like, a good, like a good mother, just trying to give you all your meats and veggies and fruits and everything. Um, I, I know of several pastors who, uh, some, they'll just preach through the book of Romans for 12 years. And then others who will preach through the book of Romans, maybe they'll go, you know, chapters 1 through 4, break. And then we'll do something else. And then we'll pick up 5 through. And I'm just kind of curious, uh, as we headed through Matthew, I was curious what my style would be. And frankly, what your style would be uh, as I look out and as I try to get a feel for, do they need something different to eat? Uh, Do we need to press pause and, and get something else? I think we're doing well. I think you're doing well. Here we find ourselves in Matthew chapter 13. This morning, and this doesn't help my case at all, I, <laughs> I readily recognize this, we're going to be looking at chapter 13, verses 31 through 33. 31 through 33. We're just going to nibble a little bit this morning. And I invite you to follow along with me. Here we are in Matthew chapter 13, which if you just let your eyes fall over Matthew 13 again, you will see that this is where Jesus is going on a parable rampage. He's just giving us parable after parable after parable after parable uh, about what the kingdom of God is like. And this morning, we see that he's going to continue explaining what the kingdom of God is like in Matthew 13, 31 through 33. Follow along as I read God's holy, inspired, inerrant word. It says, he put another parable before them saying, the kingdom of heaven... It's like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. And he told them another parable. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. Let's pray together. Father, as we spend time in your mighty word this morning, we pray that like this parable, we pray pray that your word would be like yeast that just grows to every corner and every crevice of our hearts. We pray, Lord, that your word would take root in good soil this morning and that it would grow like a mustard seed. Lord, slowly but steadily, that it would just permeate our hearts and minds and make us your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, um, when I think back on my childhood, one of the most interesting people, one of the most interesting people that I can remember was a guy by the name of Billy Wayne. Billy Wayne, Billy Wayne Harrell. And uh, Billy Wayne was one of these guys who had been around the little town of Farmersville, Texas. He had been around Farmersville forever. He was one of these kind of local legends. I don't know if you grew up in a smallish kind of town, but you had people like this, where they were just kind of the mainstays of the city. Anywhere you went in Farmersville, it felt like, it felt like Billy Wayne was the Holy Spirit. He was just ubiquitous. Uh, if you went to Dairy Queen, he was there. If you went downtown to the post office to get your mail, he was there. If, if, uh, if you went to the grocery store, you went to Fagan's, you're going down the produce aisle, there's Billy Wayne. Uh, he, was, he was everywhere. And when you saw Billy Wayne, when you saw Billy Wayne, he was going to be doing either one of two things, most likely. He was going to either be mowing or he was going to be talking. Uh, Billy Wayne, he mowed, he mowed lawns for a living just there in Farmersville. Oftentimes, you would see him so much because he would be driving around the streets of Farmersville kind of looking at yards that were overgrown like some of yours, uh, and, and he might stop, and if you were out working in your flower bed, he'd say, uh, and, and here's another thing. I said he was a talker. He was, he was, the, mo- he was the fastest talker to, to date. He was the fastest talker I have ever, I've ever known. 
uh, and uh, I've got my in-laws here today, and they can, they can amen this. There are witnesses to this. And, uh, and he, would, he would stop if he saw you out in your yard, and, and he'd, hey, there, and he'd, and he'd kind of mumble. Um, if, you, if some of you, if you grew up with King of the Hill, and there was a character named Boomhauer, don't, don't go back and watch King of the Hill, but Billy Wayne was Boomhauer. And if, you, if he got tickled about something and, 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 and he got to laughing about something, he'd, he'd start out kind of intelligible. Like, yeah, we was mowing the other day. We got to go on like that. And, and, and pretty soon you just, you just had to kind of, you know, nod. And, and he was just the sweetest guy. But he'd stop and he'd talk to you. And he actually mowed my grandmother's lawn. You've, you've heard me affectionately refer to her as Memo. And he mowed Memaw's lawn from the time, I mean, even before I was born, he was mowing Memaw's lawn. And so Billy Wayne and I, over the years, we became good friends. And, and, uh, and Memaw would always tell me when I would start to go out there to say hello to him, she'd sometimes pull me back in and say, don't get him going. You know, because she knew like, he, he'll be here for three hours uh, longer than he needs to be. The fascinating thing about Billy Wayne, though, Here's, the, here's one of the most fascinating things about Billy Wayne. By all outward accounts, if you were just to look at Billy Wayne's life and just be a fly on the wall, a fly on the truck, watching him live life, and you just first impressions, by all outward accounts, Billy Wayne was just your stereotypical, standard, blue-collar, old guy, lived by himself, didn't have any family, didn't have any money. And he, just, he wore old, tattered clothes. Same, I mean, if you saw him on this day and then you waited 10 years later, he'd be wearing that same pearl snap shirt. He drove the same kind of beat-up Chevy trucks. And he lived in a tiny shack right there off Highway 380. And in fact, if you drive through Farmersville, Texas today on your way to Greenville or East Texas, you, you can see his shack, dilapidated shack, just sitting there on the side of the road. But if you were to believe that about Billy Wayne, if you were to believe that he was just your stereotypical, I, I don't even know if he had a high school education. If you were to believe that he was just kind of your stereotypical, blue-collar, poor, old, lawn-mowing man, then you would have been wrong. At least, that is, according to my memo. Because if you talk to memo, although Billy Wayne appeared one way, although he appeared poor, if you talk to memo, unbeknownst to anyone else, his bank account showed something else. You see, sometimes, you know this as well as I do, looks can be deceiving. Looks can be very deceiving. And when we look at Matthew chapter 13 in these two parables that Jesus gives us about the mustard seed and the leaven, I think this is the exact point that Jesus was trying to get across to his hearers, that sometimes looks can be deceiving. And especially when it comes to the kingdom of God, things can be deceiving. Things are not always as they initially appear. While initially it may seem that something is small and insignificant and ordinary and just plain inadequate, slowly but surely it might be that God is building one of the most glorious things the world has ever known. Brothers and sisters, in these short verses, in, this, in these two parables, I want, you to, I want you to see two specific things about God's kingdom, two specific truths about God's kingdom that, you know, I'll confess, they're not going to wow you, but the simplicity and the clarity with which Jesus talks about his kingdom, I think, will wow us. First of all, I want you to see that the kingdom of God will grow incrementally. The kingdom of God will grow incrementally. And you're on your own if you need to know how to spell incrementally. I'm not going to do that for you. All right? Notice what he says again in verse 31. He gives us this parable of the mustard seed. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds 
But when it has grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. Now, the mustard seed was one of Jesus' favorite illustrations. It was one of his favorite object lessons that he kept in kind of his preaching and teaching tool belt. He used it elsewhere in passages like Matthew 17, verse 20, when he said, If you have faith like a mustard seed, then you will say to this mountain, right? Do you see the contrast? Tiny little mustard seed, massive mountain, okay? Tiny mustard seed, Himalayas. If you have the faith like a mustard seed, then you will say to the Himalayas, move from here to there and it will move. And if you have ever looked, if you've ever looked at or you've ever held a tiny little mustard seed, uh, you know just how tiny it is. And just to give us some, some affirmation here, Isaiah, I need, you to, I need you to verify for all the congregation. Are those seeds tiny? They're tiny, okay? Tiny little mustard seeds. And uh, the mustard seed, as tiny as it is, it was one of the tiniest, and uh, there's no way I'm even going to try to put this in here. I'll just vacuum it up later. <laughs> it was one, yeah, I should have just thrown it out on you guys. The, the mustard seed, back in Jesus' day, it was one of the smallest and most insignificant things in Jesus' day. It, it was one of the tiniest agricultural seeds in that region. And let's just stop and hit the side note real quick, because maybe you've heard some people talk like this. Critics of the Bible, this would be a, yet another point, they would stop and say, see, Jesus was wrong. He wasn't inerrant. He was a great guy, a revolutionary teacher, one of the greatest people the world ever knew, but he wasn't inerrant in his thinking. We all know because of progressive, uh, progressive knowledge and, and, and biology today, the mustard seed is not the smallest of all the seeds. And so when Jesus says in verse 31, the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field, it is the smallest of all seeds. <laughs> Poor Jesus, if, if he just knew what we knew today in modern biology and agriculture, he would know that, yes, it is tiny, it's not the smallest seed. Okay. If, if people do that, they're, they're totally missing Jesus' point. Uh, this is a figure of speech. He's saying, and in fact, he's even, I think even geographically, he's saying, hey, of all the garden plants and seeds in this region of Palestine, this is one of the smallest ones. So Jesus wasn't speaking, you know, his title, he wasn't trying to be prophet, priest, and king, and biologist. He wasn't speaking in absolute terms. He was just kind of embellishing a little bit to say, it's tiny. It's one of the tiniest things that you can think of. And the mustard seed grows into this mustard tree. In fact, if you saw, if, if you've seen an actual mustard tree, it looks more like a bush. I mean, it can get to about... 8 to 12 feet tall, so by no means is it, has it got anything on the sycamore or the oak, but among the garden trees of Israel, it was a, it was a good-sized tree. Nevertheless, though, when Jesus steps up and he compares the messianic kingdom of God to a tiny little mustard seed, that would have totally shocked, slash maybe even been revolting to Jews in that day and time, even to his own disciples. Why? Because what was their mentality of the messianic kingdom? When the messianic kingdom that has been talked about and prophesied about for years and years and years into decades, into centuries, when the messianic kingdom shows up and the Messiah steps onto the world scene, it's going gonna, it's gonna to show up with a boom. I mean, fireworks and pyrotechnics and power. It is not going to show up like a puny little mustard seed. And so when Jesus compares the kingdom of heaven to a tiny little mustard seed, in their minds, the disciples were probably sitting there, even if they kept quiet, even if old Peter kept his mouth shut, in his mind, he was probably thinking, wait, what? A mustard seed? Jesus, a, a mustard seed? That's the best we got? Like, 
I th- didn't you mean like when you're comparing the messianic kingdom that Isaiah and Ezekiel and, and all the Old Testament big guys talk about, this, this messianic glorious kingdom that's coming, didn't you mean to say something like it's, it's like a, the kingdom of heaven is like a mighty mountain or a roaring lion or something fierce and colossal? A mustard seed? Well, you're, you're losing the crowd, man. You got to know your audience. That's, that's, that's all we got. But Jesus says, my kingdom is like this mustard seed. Although it may initially seem small and insignificant and ordinary, over time, It is going to grow and to spread to the farthest reaches of the globe. And and this pattern of starting with something small, and try to follow me here, this pattern of God's starting with something small and ordinary and insignificant, it fits right in line with what we know to be true of how God works, doesn't it? I mean, just think back through the Gospel of Matthew. When the Messiah showed up on the world stage, how did he show up? Was it like a royal wedding at Westminster Abbey where all the channels were focused in on this and all the tabloids were talking about it and it was just the talk of social media? When the sinless Son of God showed up on the world stage, he slipped in quietly through the back door of a no-name teen, no-name teen's womb in an obscure village, in an obscure manger, (laughs) with a smelly group of cattle, sheep, and shepherds. And then when he gets of age to start his ministry, who did Jesus call? Who did he recruit? Did he recruit the best of the best of the best, sir? No, he didn't recruit the Jewish Avengers. He didn't assemble them together. And with, you know, this epic music in the background, we're all here together and we're going to turn the world upside down, you know, with a patch over his eye or something. That's not what he did. He went out and he chose a small ragtag group of ordinary, capital O, ordinary men. And it was from these humble, mustard-like beginnings that he started a revolution. And not just a revolution, but he turned the world upside down. And again, isn't this, just, isn't this what Jesus Christ does? Isn't this what he does? Isn't this his style, his exact pattern to take the things that initially seem small, ordinary? Just, I'm just going to see if maybe this describes anyone in this room. And maybe just... Probably not, but just how anybody has ever felt in this room. He takes the things that initially seem, and not just initially seem, but maybe actually are small, ordinary, insignificant, overlooked, and inadequate, and he uses them for his glory. This is exactly what God is doing here in this parable. It's what he did in the incarnation. It's what he's been doing from day one. And brother and sister, if you are in Christ, that's what he has done in your life. That's what he's done in my life. He has taken someone small, insignificant, inadequate, and he is doing something glorious in our midst. And this is just what he does. He takes a seemingly small and insignificant kingdom and over time he says, I'm going to take this and I'm going to spread this to the farthest reaches of the globe, to every people, language, tribe, and tongue. And this is exactly what we've seen Jesus do. This is exactly what has happened, hasn't it, over the past 2,000 years. Everything Jesus said would happen has happened. Here we have Christianity starting out like this tiny little mustard seed of a religion that initially was overlooked, it was ignored, it was trampled on. But then over time, all of a sudden, the mustard seed of the gospel 
to reach back to another parable. Over time, the mustard seed of the gospel, it found good soil in this heart. And, and, and then in this heart, and then this person, and this, this person's heart, and this person's heart, and, and then we've, pretty soon we've got a church that's forming, and then this group of 100 believers, and this group of 100 believers, and Day of Pentecost shows up, and boom, we've got 3,000 people. And then Peter's preaching his second sermon, his third sermon, and all of a sudden it's going to thousands, and then pretty soon we give enough time, and we sleep, and we wake up, and we sleep, and we wake up, and we sleep, and we wake up, and pretty soon thousands turn into millions, and millions turn into not just the Roman Roman Empire, but to Europe and to America and to China. And now, 2,000 years later, if we take a globe and we spin that sucker and we stop it, no matter where we put our finger, we will find a Christian. We will find a Christian. And here, these 2,000 years later, let's ask one another where's the Roman Empire? Where's the Egyptian and the Babylonian? And the Assyrian Empire, they're gone. Those oaks that once towered over the world's context, they're gone. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. (laughs) But let me reach back. This makes it really convenient. Let me reach back and let me just ask you. That's what we've seen happen to Rome, to Babylon, to Assyria. But what about that tiny little mustard seed that was planted, there it goes. What about that tiny little mustard seed that was planted back in Galilee some 2,000 years ago? What about that tiny little kingdom that started with just 12 ordinary men? All of a sudden we look up 2,000 years later And while the oaks and the sequoias that once were have fallen and they have fallen hard, now that tiny little mustard seed of a bush has grown up and it has become the biggest and the longest lasting tree in the history of the world. And with each passing day, it just keeps on growing. It just keeps growing. Keeps spreading out and keeps blooming and keeps spreading new branches and growing and growing. And the book, of, the book of Revelation tells us that it's not going to stop growing until one day a people from every tribe, every language, every tongue are going to be gathered around the throne praising Jesus Christ who like one of those little mustard seeds was crucified, buried in the ground and resurrected to new life. And... <laughs> And, and the promise of this parable, because some of you, you may be looking at, at, at what it talks about there with the birds and the birds gathering in the nests and what's, what's that all about. The promise of this parable, the promise of this parable is that one day, birds from every corner of the world, you think about some of the migratory birds that we see come and go on, on, on the, the path through Wichita. The promise of this parable is that one day birds from every single corner and part of the world will gather and make their eternal nest in the kingdom of God's eternal tree. They will make their nest in his tree. Birds from America, birds from Ghana and Greece and China and Chile and all over over the world. And the craziest thing about that is... That all of these birds that will flock to the eternal kingdom of God, they all came from one little tiny mustard seed. Jesus is reminding us this morning, brothers and sisters, the kingdom will grow. There's kind of like two points in that first point. The kingdom will grow. That's, that's kind of one point in the first point. It will grow. No matter what happens, no matter what the, the trends of our cultural day, no matter what the, the winds of our culture, and, and what, no matter what happens, the kingdom will grow, but it will grow incrementally. You see, the kingdom of God, it's not like Silicon Valley. It's not like Wall Street. The kingdom of God will not grow like Twitter or the founding of Facebook. Or pick your favorite startup. 
And boy, as Americans, we love those stories, and we listen to shows like This Is How I Built This, and you know, we're like, man, you know, you, you started that from this, and then in two years, you were bringing in five billion worth of revenue and all these things, and, and, and we have to say, wow, that's great, but the kingdom of God is nothing like that, Jesus says. The kingdom of God will not grow like a Silicon Valley startup. It will not grow like Twitter. It will not grow like any of those things. It's going to grow like this, incrementally, just slow, ordinary, organic, faithful growing over a long period of time. And before we go to the next point, let me just stop and ask you, brother or sister, does that ever feel like your Christian life? <laughs> does that ever feel, does this little seed right here does this ever feel like you and your Christian life? That maybe you have all these hopes and dreams of I'm going to read the Bible in a year and I'm going to memorize scripture and this 2022, man, I'm just going to grow leaps and bounds in my faith and, and my heart spiritually is going to be like a Silicon Valley startup. And then you get discouraged because... <laughs> The startup fails, and you go bankrupt, and nothing happens like you wanted it to happen. And the growth that you hoped to see when you stepped to the end of 2021, looking back on the year, was not, was not the growth that, that was the reality. But that's not the point. The point is, Matthew, Christian, when you think back on your testimony, and you, you, can't, you, can't start, you can't start evaluating right here on the timeline. We've got a timeline on the stage right here. You, you can't start evaluating right here. You can't start evaluating yesterday. The kingdom of God says you've got, you've got to take that mustard seed back to its inception. And Matthew, you've got to start at age 11. When the Holy Spirit opened your eyes to the truth of the gospel, opened your ears to receive and opened your heart to understand and believe the gospel, and you repented of your sins and you placed your faith in Jesus Christ, and the gospel seed found fertile soil in your heart. Now, when you step back and you look back over 25 years of following Jesus, Look at the growth. <laughs> You're a preacher. <laughs> what? And, and, and all of us could probably get up here and on the timeline of walking with Jesus, we could take that mustard seed and we could say, yep, the Lord planted it in the, in the good soil of my heart right here. And I've been walking with him for 25 years. Give me a break. I've been walking with him for 50 years. And Matthew, if you were to ask me yesterday about how I feel about my Christian growth and my level of spiritual maturity, I would have been pretty down. But when, by God's grace, I look back over 10 years, 15 years, 25 years, 30 years, 50 years, maybe I should make you stand and we should all sit down as it keeps going, 50 years, 60 years, 70 years, what growth. So what I'm saying to you, Christian, is if, it, if, if your Christian life, if your Christian growth, if you're, if you're becoming more and more and more like Jesus Christ feels just slow and ordinary and just, you know, that maybe it's, it's like the stock market. You'll see an initial whoop, but then you'll see a whoop, 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 whoop. But, but then you step back and you look at the stock market for a 50-year timeline. That stock that started right here, where is it today? Maybe I should be going over here. Start here. It's here. It's like the mustard seed. The kingdom will grow and it will grow incrementally. So if you look at your Christian life and you're like, well, that's pretty standard of me. No, 
Maybe the first, maybe the first year, my college life, woof. but man, it's just been incremental. And I would say, praise God, that's how he works. And I know we as a society and we as Christians, we want to gravitate to those spikes on the graph. Oh, I, I have such a boring testimony. This guy's testimony or her testimony, man, you just, her graph just shoots up. But I, and that may be the case, but I would say for most of us sitting in this room and most of the mustard seed Christians out there, most of us were mustard seed Christians. And your growth will be slow, it will be steady, but you will grow. The kingdom will grow incrementally. Secondly, I want you to see about the kingdom. The kingdom will transform internally. It will grow incrementally, but the kingdom will also transform internally as it goes. Look at verse 33. In verse 33, he uses this example of leaven. The mustard seed was one of his favorite illustrations that he liked to use, but leaven was also one that he used quite a bit when it came to object lessons. Usually, though, leaven was something that Jesus would reference and use as a, as a bad example. You've got the leaven of the Pharisees. It was false teaching. It was sin, but not, not so here. Here, Jesus uses leaven as an illustration of, of the way in which the kingdom of God slowly but surely and oftentimes invisibly spreads its way and permeates its way throughout the world. Notice again what he says in verse 33. He says, The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour. If you're a good Bible student, you're asking yourself, you're being inquisitive and you're saying, why did he say three? Why not one? Does he, does he have a massive family or something? Is, is there a banquet coming? Why three measures? Could have been two. Could have been one. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leaven. Now, I don't know if you're bakers. I don't know if you like baking bread. Uh, if you do, you need to show some love to your pastor and just, that'd be a great gift. Great gift. It'd be applying scripture here. Um, when it comes to baking bread, even though you can't see the yeast in the dough, what's happening? Even though you can't see it, what's happening is that yeast, it's working. It's, 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 it's changing things. It's doing stuff. And, and in fact, it's, it's changing every single thing that it touches. Everything that yeast touches in that dough, it, it's changing. And it's changing from the inside out. Yeast changes bread from the inside out. And here you see where I'm going with the gospel. So is the gospel. The gospel is like yeast that changes bread from the inside out. Even though you can't always see it, the gospel is working. This little, this little mustard seed of the gospel, once it gets placed in this heart or this heart or this heart, even though you can't see everything that's going on in, in your child or whoever, that, that classmate or that coworker or across the globe, even though we can't always see it, the gospel is always working. It's always doing stuff. It's always changing things. It's always changing people. And it's doing so from the inside out. You see, God, the gospel, think of it like, like that yeast. The gospel starts out like yeast in the dough. The gospel comes into your heart. If you're a Christian, this is, this is, this is what happened to you. Or this is what should have happened to you. The gospel comes into your heart... And then it starts doing stuff. <laughs> and and, and maybe, maybe when you came to faith, you had certain sections in your heart that you were like, you know, if you, if you don't have to touch this, I'd really appreciate it, you know. Hey, have your way over here, you know. But don't touch this. Uh, in fact, I'm going to put a few locks on this closet. And I'm just going to make sure, uh, maybe put some yellow tape on it just so you know. Don't mess with this. Everything else is yours. But when the gospel comes into a person's heart, what starts happening? Like, like the yeast in the dough, it's, it starts changing everything. It starts messing with everything. All of a sudden, the gospel comes in and it starts to permeate into your, your thoughts. 
It starts to affect the way you think. It starts to affect the, the way you believe. It starts to affect your affections and your desires and what you like and what you don't like. It starts messing with, with your words and, and your actions. And it starts affecting and permeating everything. And pretty soon we look up, again, go back to the timeline, mustard seed planted, yeast gets in the heart. And then it st starts growing. And over time, it not only affects everything within you, it starts messing with and changing and transforming things outside of you, the people that you're closest to. The gospel doesn't stop with your heart and your life. All of a sudden, the gospel starts coming out of your mouth to those that you love, to your coworkers, to your kids, to your classmates. And the gospel, just the, the, the yeast of the gospel, all of a sudden takes root in their heart, it starts affecting their mind and their thoughts and their beliefs and their affections. And then the gospel starts coming out of their mouth. And this is the explosion of Christianity in the Roman Empire. The, the, the tree just kept growing. The yeast and the dough just kept rising. Into this heart, into this heart, into this heart. And the fact that the woman in this parable, the fact that the woman in this parable takes the leaven and hides it in how many, how many measures? Three measures of flour is significant. Number one, it means this woman is ambitious. Right? Can't you see her in there just taking that yeast and uh, putting her fist into it and getting everything going? She's ambitious. It also is illustrative of the fact of the power of this leaven. Because that is a lot of flour. Back in that day, three measures of flour would have been the equivalent of 50 pounds of flour. 50 pounds of flour. The only reason you'd be messing around with 50 pounds of flour is if you were making bread for a banquet of people, a hundred plus. And I think what Jesus, the point that Jesus was trying to make here is that when his kingdom spreads and grows, it's not just going to spread into this little corner of the world over here. Just one measure. It's not just going to, it's not just going to permeate into this part of the globe. One measure. I think with the illustration, Jesus is saying, no, no, no. We're not talking one measure. We're not talking two measures. We're talking a number of completion, three. That when the gospel gets into this world and the kingdom of God starts growing, I, guys, it's going to grow slow. It's going to grow incrementally. You Americans, you're going to get impatient with yourself. You're going to look out at the world and think it's all going to hell in a handbasket. And you're just going to, you know. But meanwhile, that gospel Meanwhile, my kingdom, it's spreading not just into this measure of flour, not, not just into this corner of the world, not, not just to China, not just to Korea, not just to America, but to Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa. <laughs> and it's going to go somewhere else. And it's, it's just going to flourish and grow. It's going to spread everywhere. Three measures of flour. However much bread you want to make, it's spreading. But it's going to do so quietly, internally, but transformatively. So all of that, here's what I'm saying to you. From this passage, looking at the parable of the mustard seed and the leaven, when you look out on the world today, do not be discouraged. Do not be discouraged because you're going to be tempted to be discouraged. I was having a conversation with somebody yesterday where we were talking about just the state of, of public schools and things that we're, we're having to, teachers are having to mess with and just ropes that, that you know, is one of those, if you would have talked to our great grandparents and all, it, 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 no way they could understand this. And so I know it's easy to look out on the world and, and, and it seems like, it looks like, it feels like that the kingdom of God is waning. It's easy to look out at the world and just to feel like, man, that mustard seed is just getting trampled over. And the leaven, it's gone sour. It's not working. But I would remind you, Olivet, I would remind you what Jesus said here in these two parables. Although you can't see it, and oftentimes we feel like we're just the authoritative person that can see everything. Although you can't see it, and although you oftentimes cannot feel it, the kingdom of God is growing. It's growing today, 
it's going to grow tomorrow. And you're going to get sick, you know, next week or next month. And you're going to be down and out. And it's going to keep growing. And then you're just going to keep laying your head on your pillow and waking up and having your Folgers or your Starbucks and going about your day and going, laying your head back down and getting back up. And sun's going to come up. Sun's going to go down. Sun's going to come up. Sun's going to go down. Day after day, it's just going to keep growing until Jesus Christ returns and he comes back for the harvest. So brothers and sisters, it doesn't matter what things appear like out there right now. Remember my buddy Billy Wayne. Looks can be deceiving. And they can be especially deceiving, Jesus says, when it comes to the kingdom of God. So be encouraged as you go out into this day and into this week in our cultural moment, you be encouraged. God's kingdom, although you can't see it, and I'm with you, it oftentimes doesn't feel like it. It's growing. And then secondly, on the heels of that, I would say by way of application, you need to be encouraged, but you also, especially you type A'ers, you need to be patient. Because you you really jived with that Silicon Valley startup Wall Street thing. You're like, yeah, that's how we need to grow the gospel. And, And Jesus is just reminding you this morning, that's not going to be the way it goes. You're going to look out. You're going to be frustrated at times. You're going you're to have the why God questions. And meanwhile, Jesus is just going to just keep slowly but surely building his church. So, so be encouraged. Be patient. And lastly, I would say to you and to me, be active. Be active. Because although the gospel message, and although the kingdom of God has spread like crazy over these last 2,000 years, let me remind you that there are still pockets of our globe who have never heard the, the gospel. There are unreached, unengaged people groups. There are people groups like Kyle and Kathy are helping us to connect with, like the Patari in India, who don't have a church, who, who largely don't know the name of Christ, And they don't know what Christ is about. They don't know anything about the person and work of Christ. So until Jesus Christ, our king, who owns the kingdom, until he sees fit to call us home, let's be active participants in advancing his kingdom. Let's seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, all the while remembering everything I need out here, everything I need that I'm wearing Everything that I need for life and godliness, he has promised you, Christian, I'll provide that. I own the kingdom. I own the cattle on a thousand hills. I own everything. And if you will just seek first my kingdom and my righteousness, my agenda, not your agenda. If you will seek me first and my agenda first, all these other things that worry you, make you anxious, and keep you up, and give you the TMJ, and, you know, I'll take care of that. So let's seek first his kingdom, his righteousness. Let's pray that the gospel would keep flourishing and spreading. That's why pretty much every Sunday morning, you're going to hear us talk about the nations. You're going to hear us pray about the gospel spreading somewhere. We're gonna, where, where did we pray for last week? Philippines, or where was it? Peru, something. It's just a reminder. It's a mustard seed. Here's some birds. Here's some birds that that are going to be with us in the tree of God's kingdom. So let's pray for people to come to faith. And above all, let's just continue to tell people about our king. Let's continue to tell people about Jesus and his glorious kingdom. Because the glorious thing about it is, it's not just a kingdom that we're waiting on. If we believe what Jesus said is the kingdom is at hand. He came onto the scene and he said, no, 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 it's not something you're having to wait with. It's here. Why? Because I'm the king and I just stepped onto your world. The kingdom is here. I'm, and I'm going to keep building it until I come back for you. And so let's keep telling people about our glorious, loving, good king. And let's keep, let's keep helping them understand how they can enter into the kingdom. Because if we truly love people, we want them to experience and to know what kingdom life is like. And above all, we want them to know our king. 
And if you don't know Jesus Christ, if you don't know what it's like to be a part of his kingdom, and you want to join his kingdom, it's very simple. The way in which you enter into the kingdom is just by submitting to the king, loving the king, worshiping the king, orienting every aspect of your life around the king. And I know, I know, 21st century American, that when we think about dethroning ourselves and putting somebody else at the center of the orbit, we think, how can that be glorious? How can that be good? How, how, can that, how can that be good for me in the long run? That's the way the kingdom is. Looks are often deceiving. So I invite you to trust in the king and become a part of the kingdom. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, you are our king. You are our glorious, wonderful, majestic king. We praise you. We worship you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for little reminders like the parable of the mustard seed and the parable of the leaven that, that just are such good reminders to us as we look out on our world, and there's so many things just that could tempt us to be discouraged, to despair, to think that your kingdom is not growing, to think that the mustard seed is just going to get trampled on, things are going to go from bad to worse, and yet we're reminded from your word this morning that looks are not always what they seem, that Lord, what you started so so small, that ordinary, that small, that seemingly insignificant kingdom that you brought some 2,000 years ago into this world. Lord, you have been building it. And one of the premier cases and points of that is the fact that here in 2022, on Sunday morning, May 1st, in this windy corner of, of the earth, Wichita. Men and women are worshiping you, Lord Jesus. Oceans away, thousands of miles away from where the mustard seed of your kingdom started. Lord, we trust in you. We believe in you. We're thankful for the kingdom and we're thankful and humble, Lord, that you allow us to play a role in advancing that kingdom. Help us to pray, help us to seek first, and help us to share the gospel of the kingdom with those around us because we long for them to be a part of the kingdom with us in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together and sing about the kingdom.
trumpet sound. Oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. Let's sing Christ alone. Christ alone, cornerstone, the weak made strong in the Savior's love through the Thank you for gathering with us uh, to worship the risen Christ, the Lord of all. Uh, as you go out into your week, uh, hopefully you got a bulletin or you're getting the email, just be reminded, uh, Caring Well Group meets tonight, 5 o'clock. Uh, tomorrow, it being the first Monday of the month, we're going to do a church-wide fast for those of you who are able to, uh, where we're just abstaining from food from sunup to sundown, and we're going to be uh, specifically praying for just the health and vitality and, and just the godliness of, of the marriages in our faith family. So we'd invite you to join us with that. Uh, this Wednesday night, Awana is now over. And so as we get ready to kind of kick off our summer classes for all ages, kids all the way up to adults, uh, this Wednesday night, as we're going to do the first Wednesday night of every month throughout the summer, we're just going to have a summer fellowship. And we're going to cater in Chick-fil-A, just to get you all here. Uh, we're going to cater in Chick-fil-A. And uh, hopefully we're going to have good weather. Bring your lawn chairs, bring your cornhole, bring uh, washers, can jam, whatever you got. Uh, bring your baseball glove. Football, let's throw it around, and uh, we're just going to hang out. Wednesday night, 6.30, come and enjoy the fun, the festivities there. Uh, ladies, you've, we've got Mother's Day breakfast, summer meetup, summer classes, talked about that. Our book of the month for May is one of the classics from Jerry Bridges entitled The Practice of Godliness. And so we invite you to join us, uh, even if you can't come that last Thursday of the month, just to read it with us. And brothers and sisters, as we go out into this week, receive the Lord's benediction from 2 Corinthians chapter 13. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. You're dismissed.